All right, so welcome everyone. So uh, Miren, you don't see here like uh, the room, but we have like around 10, 15 people in the room. Uh, so uh, my name is Israel, um, and, and together with, today with Miren, who is joining from Madrid. So we're gonna be talking about split, splitable defense in Python. So for the workshop uh, today, we are gonna be explaining first, where are these splitable do functions, why they are relevant, and how you implement a splitable do function in Apache Mini in Python. And later on, we will be doing a hands-on workshop where we will design two splitable do functions, one for reading batch files in parallel, and another one for reading data from a Kafka-like queue with partitions. And I say Kafka-like because the first, the, the example that we're gonna be doing live is synthetic. You don't need any kind of Kafka or anything available. It, it, it will be all generated randomly, data generated randomly. And in the repo, you have also instructions on how to set up a, a Kafka cluster in local. So you, if you want to try to, to do also the, the splitable functions for Kafka. And we are going to leave that as an exercise. OK, so when the solution is provided, the solution for the Kafka cluster too. But then so after the workshop, so we will encourage you to repeat the same exercise with the Kafka, which is it's going to be kind of easy because it's going to be very, very similar. So. So, Miren, you ready to share your screen? Uh, yeah, sure. One second. So, okay, while Miren is sharing the screen, I think I'm gonna switch off the camera here. Okay, great. Now, let me put here the layout. like this yes okay so um, um i was going to say something and i forgot well uh, you have a version of this slides in the repository too okay but anyway so uh, miren uh, the floor is yours yeah cool thank you yeah so as israel here you have uh, as israel said uh, just now you have there the the link to the repository and the slides uh, are available there guys so you can have them after to, to check them after the after the session okay cool so i mean the idea is that i now do a brief introduction to the concept of splitable do functions so you have like a, a bit of an overview and and some tools to understand better the the lab that you are going to be doing with together with israel okay so uh, let me let me start um, with a uh, with a bit of history, okay? So with uh, Apache being being like a, a programming model for for building for a programming model that will allow us to build like uh, data processing pipelines for both like uh, streaming and and batch uh, use cases, it comes the need sometimes to use like uh, I/O connectors, right? To to read or write um, to or from uh, um, sources like sources and and sinks, okay. And sometimes those connectors are already available are already available uh, together with the SDK. But sometimes we have to build them ourselves. So uh, until fairly recently, we had like two options to implement like uh, custom IO, okay. So for simple scenarios, mainly for, for bounded sources, we have the option to create like mini pipelines, okay? And those mini pipelines were made of like basic uh, Apache Bean core transforms like uh, the Pardu, like the Pardu transform and the group by key transform, okay? And then for more complex scenarios, we had like uh, the source, uh, the source API, okay? Good. So, uh, if we take the the simple use cases where we were building like uh, connectors as mini pipelines, uh, pipelines uh, were generally consistent consisting of like two part do two part do transforms. Okay, one that was um, splitting the data that was incoming like uh, from the source in in parts, and later on another one that was reading those parts uh, that we have split in parallel okay and 
in between the two parts, we were um, wedging in a, like a group by key transform to allow to have like a different number of workers for the first part do the one that was doing the split and the one that was uh, doing the read okay so very simple right so if we see this in a in an example for instance in a scenario let's imagine that like uh, our pipeline receives like a, a file glob like a file uh, pattern as input okay and we have to read the records of uh, the files that match uh, that pattern okay so what we would what would we be doing so what we would be doing is like uh, for instance create like a use a create transform okay that would read um, that would create a p collection from a list with a single element and that list would like that element would be the the file glob okay and then uh, that would be taken by, by a pardu transform that would be extracting all the all the file paths matching the the pattern okay and we would have all the file paths in a in an output p collection and then finally so let me activate my my pointer here at this point we, we would have a, a pardu transform that would be like reading uh, the records of each of the files okay and in between we had the group by key to allow to have like different number of uh, workers okay because here we will have one working one worker doing the doing the, the extraction of the paths but here we want to process all those paths in parallel okay so uh, this is very simple quite nice but um, there is a limitation what will happen for instance if the files were not like equal in size and some were like so much bigger than the others we could end up having uh, like a stagglers in our pipeline no so the, there would be like a processing of some file of some files could take really really long okay and result uh, resulting in like poor pipeline performance okay so another limitation that we would have following following this approach of the mini pipelines so imagine that we would be uh, wanting to receiving as as input like a kafka topic and our pipeline would have to read like uh, all the the messages in all the partitions of that kafka topic okay so very similar to the previous uh, use case we would receive like we would we would receive the the topic name in uh, in a create like a transform we would extract the partitions but then when it comes to read the data from the partitions what happens like uh, partitions uh, can be unbounded you can have like an infinite uh, uh, number of uh, of messages in the partition okay and then like uh, uh, and if we do this in a do function like a do function can like output zero one or many uh, elements but it cannot be there running like uh, forever okay so um how uh, until now were we solving these uh, limitations so some of these limitations were solved by the by the source api okay so the source api comes with uh, a few advantages okay so uh, it is designed so so we can read uh, bounded and unbounded data sources okay in parallel using multiple workers okay also for for unbounded data sources it implements like uh, checkpointing and then resuming the the reads okay for for bounded sources okay it has like uh, all those features that enable like auto scaling like reporting on progress doing dynamic uh, work rebalancing and for and for unbounded sources it allows to report like uh, report the sources watermark the backlog so it has lots of advantages but it is not like uh, all gold uh, that glitters okay it comes also with a few like a few cons okay so I don't know if you guys had the chance to, to develop like a, a connector, an IO connector with the source API, 
but uh, it is not easy to do like it it is quite complex it comes with a lot of boilerplate code that you have to write and because it's complex like uh, uh, developers tend to make uh, errors when when they approach uh, developing with the source api okay it also does not compose very well uh, because, uh, well, it, it does not compose at all because uh, you have to uh, specify um, the source at the beginning, at the root of the pipeline, okay? So, like, uh, it also has, like, a, an API for bounded sources and an API for unbounded sources. So, very... <clears throat> seemingly very similar uh, bounded and unbounded sources, you cannot reuse the, the same code uh, for them. Unlike what you can do with a, with a do function, okay? That like you can use it in bounded and unbounded scenarios, okay? And there are problems, sometimes you face problems that are easy, that are hard to classify, okay? So, for instance, consider that we are ingesting like a, a very large and continuously growing data set. So, for instance, imagine that we are monitoring a, a watching a directory to see if new files are being created. Okay. So, do I consider that a, a bounded source scenario because I already have some files there when I go to watch, but an unbounded because it is like constantly growing and new files are added? So it's hard to classify that kind uh, of problem using this API, OK? So what happened then? So some of the Apache Beam like gurus um, thought that maybe a good uh, starting point to resolve all these uh, issues uh, that the source API had was uh, to take the do function, OK? And, uh, and try to overcome with do functions the limitations that the source API. And why why they thought of this? Because like do functions are like simple, it's easy, they are easy to code. The code that I write works both for bounded and, and unbounded scenarios, and they are composable, right? I can put like a do function at any point, like in any transform at any point in my in my pipeline. Okay. But do functions have a few limitations that the source API did not have, okay? So one of the limitations is around splitability, okay? So do functions run in a monolithic way. I, I take a, an element, I run it, I get an output, okay? And then they have, they don't like really, they are, for the runner, they are like a black box. They don't interact with it, you know? They just the runner just tells, look, execute this, that is in this do function, okay? So we need to bring those two things, okay, to the do function if we want to, to have like source API-like properties in it, like splitability and runner interaction, okay? So the solution was to create the, the splitable do function, okay? So the split all do function is just like, as I said, a generalization of the do function. So I can bring in those uh, source API characteristics and, and use them to functions to implement composable IO, IO connectors or components, okay? That's the main use case. Although there are other advanced use cases that we are not going to cover here that are for non-IO scenarios, okay? So how does the, how does, like uh, generally speaking, uh, a splitable do function work. So the processing of a, of an element is going to the to be the the, the composed in what we call uh, restrictions, and restrictions could be potentially infinite if we con consider a, a an unbounded source. Okay. So and what is a restriction? A restriction just describes like a, a part of the work uh, to be done for the whole element, okay? So here on the screen, you have the steps that uh, like um, that you have to, to follow when you are executing like a, a do function. So you are going to take each element, for instance, and, so, and you are going to pair it with what we call an initial restriction. And I give you, you are going to very easily understand what the initial restriction is with an example. Imagine that we are going um, to process a file and we have the file name and the restriction, the initial restriction 
is going to be like a, an offset range that represents the the whole file no with the with the start being zero and the end being the actual uh, file size in bytes okay so that's our initial restriction okay so for each element this initial restriction is going to be split into smaller restrictions okay so i could decide for instance to split my file in ranges of 64 64k or 64 megs you know like uh, I, I decide a, a initial split okay so the runner then is going to distribute the element and this uh, restriction pairs to the workers okay and they are going to workers are going to execute to start executing uh, in parallel those uh, element and restriction pairs okay and at some point okay the runner like can decide uh, as the pipeline is running to do further splits okay based on the on the on different conditions for instance it might be that there is something uh, an staggler and and you want to to split uh, that restriction and and start processing a smaller smaller chunks of work okay so here you just have a diagram that uh, that um, represents the whole process where you take the element with the initial restriction and then you do the initial splits okay so you have uh, the element and the and the like let's say partial restriction or the initial split and then as as it is executing because of the signals that the runner is uh, getting it will decide on doing further splits okay so we start over again like doing more splits okay so like uh, here a couple of examples i will give you an example with a bounded source and an unbounded source okay so as we said before like the read of a file like uh, imagine that we represent this as as a as a restriction with a range from zero to to 100 okay so we can do initial splits okay ranges of bytes okay in this case and then if we take an unbounded source it's a bit different okay because imagine that we are reading from a from a partition in a topic the number of messages can be like uh, infinite okay so uh, we can represent this as imagine that we start reading from offset 100 so we say um, like the range is from grand 100 to to infinity you know like but this when we code we would represent it with a very large inter integer for instance right and then what the what the runner is going to to do it is going to start uh, splitting this this uh, chunk of work okay and it's going to create like a like a, a primary restriction that is bounded and a residual restriction that continues to be uh, unbounded for later execution by by another thread where by another like uh, do do function process call okay so and that's like um and this i mean even if you see this for an unbounded source it's placed uh, splits like this like in a in a primary restriction and residual restriction can also cure for for a bad uh, like a, a bounded source too for instance if for some reason like uh, like uh, some process uh, is lagging we might want to to do the split too no in a in a primary and a residual okay we will see it uh, later on when we when we go into for into deeper details of of how splitable the functions work so when what are the the components the the key components when i go and write a split our do function that i have to 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 take into account and implement so if i am writing a, a basic split our do function okay uh, there are three components the restriction the restriction provider and the restriction tracker and then for advanced uh, uh, split our do functions where for instance i might require uh, watermark control there are three additional components that is like something representing the watermark state the watermark estimator provider and the watermark estimator okay 
So let's uh, dig in into each of these components, what they do and what uh, what's their function when working with the split only functions. So a restriction is something that, as we said, represents a, a, a piece of work of the processing that needs to be done uh, for an element, okay? And we don't have to implement any specific uh, class, okay? Uh, it's something that we as developers will, will define. We can use whatever represents best uh, for us a restriction, okay? Then the, the restriction provider, what is going to, to give us uh, is the um, mainly the, the initial restriction that uh, that's the starting point like uh, for for my for my element the initial restriction and a tracker okay of the restriction and then the the restriction tracker is going to to allow us to track which parts of uh, for which parts of the the restriction processing has already been completed okay so those those three elements for some uh, for some scenarios, like for instance, if I, if I am working with with files uh, and I can represent restri res restrictions as offset ranges, like in the SDK, you already have like implementations for for that uh, for for uh, working with ranges. Okay, so you have like a class that is called offset range that represents a restriction and the offset restriction track. Okay. So you, you already have there and you can use them in your code, okay? For other scenarios, it might be that you cannot work with this and you have to do your own implementations, okay? So let's look at, at what do I need to do when I am uh, approaching the, the implementation. So we said we need a, like a restriction provider, okay? So we have to extend uh, from the class restriction provider and there are three key uh, methods that you will guys three mandatory methods that you will give you will need to implement okay the one that is going to to return the the initial restriction so for instance if in the scenario uh, where we were processing file it will it will return like an offset range with a start being zero and the end being the the file size in bytes okay so that would be our initial restriction then a, a, an actual uh, tracker, okay? And the tracker is the one that we are going to, I mean, an, inst an, instantiation, an instance of the, of the tracker that you are going to use. And then the, the, a, me a method that is going to, to return the, the, restriction, the restriction size, okay? So for a, for a given restriction, it has to return a, like a, a non-negative value. We will see later how the runner is going to, to use this uh, return restriction size to make, uh, to make decisions, okay? And then uh, other methods that you might need to, to provide, uh, I mean, there are uh, that you might need to, to implement, okay? So a coder, but this is not mandatory. It is uh, only retried. Uh, only only necessary if you require i mean if you cannot infer the the coder to use for the restriction uh, at runtime okay the split um the split method is uh, the one that i am going to use like to do the initial splits okay uh, the initial splits that i am going to then pass to the to the workers okay then there is a very similar method, method called a split and size that is just, I mean, doing the same as a split does. So the initial splits plus it provides you with the size of each of the splits, okay? And then uh, truncate. Truncate is, uh, uh, is uh, invoked, for instance, when we are, when we are going to, to drain the, the pipeline, okay? And then, uh, when it comes to the to the restriction tracker, so uh, also it extends from from the restriction tracker class, okay, and then uh, you have to at least override the override the methods that you see that you see on the screen. So the first one is going to 
I mean, you will see in a bit that like a, a do function process invocation will have an associated tracker, okay? And thanks to the, this method, like the the current restriction one, the do the do function process uh, method is going to be able to retrieve uh, the the current restriction, no? The one where, that we are processing at a at a point in time. And uh, this, uh, watch out, because this, the restriction, can change. Because at the same time that we are doing uh, our processing, um, the runner can be deciding to, to try and split our restriction, OK? So bear that into uh, account, OK? Then, uh, like we will see that before before doing any actual processing in the, in the do, function we have to to claim uh, so if we are going to do the processing uh, starting in a position we have to to actually claim it okay before doing any before doing any output okay and if uh, the position that we are going to claim is inside the boundaries of the of the current restriction our claim is going to be accepted and we can proceed to the actual to the actual um, processing and output of of that uh, uh, do function. Okay, if for instance we have not uh, we cannot claim that position, we will have to to return. Okay, um, uh, immediately uh, the pro uh, so we should not continue doing any processing in the do function and return. Okay, then there is another method that uh, that uh, has to tell us whether the actual processing of the restriction has completed or not if it has completed it will return true and if it has um uh, it is still uh, stuff pending it will return a, it will raise a, a value error okay and then another another method to to implement is this is uh, underscore bounded one that is going to tell us whether the, the current restriction uh, um, that we are processing, it is uh, bounded or so the amount of work that is going to do is bounded or outbounded. This, uh, this um, like the current restriction, you will be invoking it from the do function, the train claim two, and the check done and is bounded, they, these are used by the runner, okay? But you have to provide implementations. And then, um, so until now we saw like the, the implementations that are mandatory. Then there is one that you have to implement in, in um, when you are working in a streaming scenarios, you, for sure you have to implement and that it is also recommended to implement also in batch scenarios, okay? But it's not mandatory in those cases. So, and it's the try split. And the try split is the one that does what we were discussing before, the one that the runner will will invoke, okay, to create uh, from a, uh, from an existing current restriction a primary restriction and a residual restriction, okay. So that is for sure necessary if our restriction is uh, unbounded. For sure, you will have to keep splitting, you know, because uh, you want to like process bounded chunks, no? So you have to continue. And if, uh, for instance, it's a bounded source, it might be that you need to proceed to a split because uh, like the pipeline is uh, stuck or not progressing as uh, because it has stagglers, no? right? So, and one of the attributes that uh, it's being passed is um, what you see there. Uh, fraction of, of uh, reminder, okay? And what is this? This is a hint that the runner gives and tell us like um, when we are going to do the split, like uh, the percentage of the work le le left to process that the, that the primary restriction should represent. We have included here a, an example, okay? So imagine that you have a like a restriction that goes from 100 to 200 and we have already processed up to 130 okay so how would i calculate the primary and the residual restrictions so it will do 
what's pending? So 200 minus 130, no? 70 is still pending. And the, and the runner is telling me that the primary should represent 70% uh, uh, of what's left. So the primary should be 100 and then 100 and should that at 130, that is what is already processed plus the 70% of what's left, no? So from 100 to 179 and the rest will be the residual restriction. So that's how fraction of reminder is used, okay? And then finally, in the restriction tracker, there is another method that it's advisable, I mean, not mandatory, but advisable to, to provide an implementation that is um, letting the runner row, uh, letting the runner know how the processing is, how the processing is going, okay? Uh, so uh, like out, out of the restriction that I had to, uh, have, uh, I had to process, how much has been processed, okay? Good. So now let's jump and see how do how do we code it? And I think it's best, best if I go die straight to the to the code, okay? So when it comes to to the to the restriction like uh, tracker and provider, okay? How how do I supply it? So first of all, I will create. I can create like a, a class and implement the 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 mandatory methods I was telling you about. So the initial restriction, create tracker and restriction size, okay? And then the difference with a standard do function is that uh, one of the parameters that the process uh, method will receive is the actual tracker. That is, uh, it will have to be a single parameter that has this type, like restriction param, okay? And in the constructor, I like I, I pass the instance of the restriction provider that I want to use. Alternatively, what you can do is you can go to the um, do function and make it extend from restriction provider, okay? And then like uh, implement the, the mandatory methods, let's say, and then uh, pass like a, a restriction parameters of here, but it will, it will not pass the provider, okay? So those are the two ways of doing it. And then um, let's discuss now what I would be doing in the in the process method call, okay? So basically what I would do is like uh, recover the, the current like uh, restriction that is passed as argument, try to, to lock the, the position and then uh, proceed to the, the, the to the processing, okay? And do whatever output the 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 standard do function needs to uh, so the splitable do function needs to to do, okay? Important. Don't do any any output or perform any side effects if you could not get the the claim, okay? In that case. Uh, uh, it could, if you could not get the lock in that case, what you would be doing is returning immediately, okay? Then, a couple of things that you, you need to be taking into account. If uh, the amount of work that the that is going to be performed uh, for that element is unbounded, for instance, if in the example that we were discussing before, that we were reading from messages from Kafka, from a Kafka partition, I have to, there is a decorator that I have to use to annotate my, to annotate my process, my process method and say that, that is unbounded per element, okay? And then another important thing to do is like, uh, as we said in parallel, the, the runner can be doing uh, splits, okay? So it's not a good idea not a good idea to go and store the state of the current restriction in a local variable because like the current restriction could have actually changed okay we said before that the current invocation when there is a split the 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 primary um, like the the current invocation keeps the primary the primary restriction but it's different you know like from the from the original one and the and the residual and the residual restriction will be taken by by another process okay so 
Then, like here, you have an example of, of, a, of an implementation, okay? Um, considering the, the uh, use case where we were reading a file. So, for instance, um, we will be like opening the file. We will be like fetching the current restriction and get uh, like the position will be the, the start of that restriction. And we, we, we do a seek and then we, we claim that, uh, that position and proceed to the, to the processing. Okay. If uh, for some reason I could not take the, the claim, I would have to return it. Okay, so what would I do to to like uh, provide initial splits? Uh, uh, so implement this method. Uh, so for instance, if I have like very large large files for for doing a better like uh, a better parallelization of the work, I could decide to split the files in chunks of of sixty four megs. Okay, so I would like do this in the in the in the split method to to create restrictions that are of 64 mega, uh, meg, megabytes is, is like uh, the last one being a bit smaller because it, it might be that it's not an exact multiple of of 64 okay when um, we saw also that there is a, a method that returns the the size of the restriction okay so this sizing information is used at two points by by the runner. Uh, it can be used uh, at the beginning, okay, to decide like how they do the initial parallelization of work, and it can be used while already running to do splits, okay. So let's uh, take the the example that we were discussing before for the file, okay. So the the restriction size is like the the end offset minus the start uh, offset okay uh, but what for instance so in this case all restrictions we have a like a cost that is proportional to the file size okay but what if for instance i i know that because of the code that i am going to run in the in the process function i already know that there are uh, some file extensions that are going to be like more computational expensive, you know, that it's going to take like much more compute power to, to process them. So like this is a, an implementation, for instance, where I take the, the actual file extension and I assign different weights to the, to the different extensions, okay? And I have like a correction factor. So this is a good indication for the runner because they know, look, processing these files is going to be much more expensive than the others. So they can they can use this information to take uh, to take decisions. Okay. So there will be a scenarios. So for instance, where uh, like I am about to process like a, a like a an element and restriction pair. And, and my that my data the data that that I need to to like complete the, the processing is not is not ready okay and this is like a very frequent like uh, uh, when we are working for instance with unbounded with unbounded restriction okay but it can also happen with bounded words so like consider like some of the scenarios that we were discussing before we are reading from kafka from a kafka topic partition and nobody is publishing nobody is publishing messages okay or we are watching a directory uh, and no new files are being created or like i have a like i have a source system that is throttling me and not letting me like read uh, i am stuck there no so what should I do in those scenarios? So, what I should, I, I what I should do. So, for instance, if I can, there's nothing to read from Kafka, nothing to to read from the directory, no new file. So, what I should do is return in my in my in my process call. Okay. So, uh, I am signaling. Uh, to the to the runner that the processing of the current restriction is not done and it can continue at a later time okay and what i can do is suggest like a time to resume 
to resume at, okay? Well, after X uh, seconds or after X minutes or, and then the runner will try to honor it, although it cannot like promise to honor exactly that, that time to resume the, the processing, okay? We have a, an example here, no? So this is this is exactly what we call a user initiated checkpoint, okay? So I am trying to fetch uh, from an external uh, system and I, I did not get any records because I am being throttled or or I get a timeout, okay? So what I do is I, I have to return for sure and then optionally tell them, look, try to resume like a... Um, execution in 10 seconds or in 60 seconds okay so that would be the way to proceed and then finally uh, just uh, like a few pointers on what to do when we need to do some watermark control okay so first thing we would need something that will uh, like a user defined object like to to represent like the watermark state okay like the simplest form of this can be just like a, a timestamp, okay? Then we have to, to provide like a, a watermark, an implementation of a watermark estimator, okay? Uh, the watermark estimator, what it, does it do? It's going to track the watermark mark, uh, state as we process, as we, as we go on with the processing of element and restriction pairs is going to, to track the state uh, of the watermark, okay? And then the watermark estimator provider is going to let, let us initialize the, the watermark state, although you will see that in most of the implementations that are available now in this decade, like the initial state is like none, okay? But if we are checkpointing and resuming, we would have a state. So like uh, in that case, it would not be in none, okay? And then um, this uh, extends for from, you see the watermark uh, estimator provider, okay? So what's the default when it comes to split all the functions? What's the default behavior? The default behavior is not to do, not to use any of those components that I have shown you, no? No provide any watermark estimator. And the runner is just computing like the output watermark as the minimum of all the upstream watermarks, okay? But if we if we want to do like uh, have more control and do a proper um, like uh, provide a more accurate like watermark, the thing to do um, is uh, I mean for for an advanced behavior we would be doing the the following one. Right? So we will do like we will create an implementation of the watermark estimator provider, okay? And this is going to return the initial estimation for the watermark that, uh, as I said, in most cases, it will be, to begin with, it will be none. And then it will, um, we will also, uh, like the watermark estimator provider will create a, like an instance of the, of the watermark estimator, and that's the one that tracks the, the, the watermark, okay, as the processing goes on. Um, and it can, I mean, there are different implementations that you can use and or do for the watermark estimator. You can update the, the, uh, the estimation of the watermark uh, from the manually, from the uh, process, uh, from the process call, okay, or you can use like the, the world time, or, or you can use like a, like the output uh, timestamp of your of your elements, okay? And then the, what is the runner doing? The runner is going to to use for the computation of the actual watermark. Is going to take the minimum over all the upstream watermarks of all the the uh, steps that are before in the in the in the pipeline. And the estimation reported by each uh, by each element and restriction pair. Okay, uh, and one thing like uh, to take into account is that the watermark must monotonically increase. Okay, as we are processing as we are processing the element and restriction pairs. Okay, and, and finally, just a note like the the element and restriction pair when it stops processing the 
the, the, water, the watermark, it's not considered in this computation that I was mentioning before, okay? And currently, so you know, there are three, three different estimators, okay? A manual, a manual one where, where you, uh, it has like a set watermark method that you can invoke from the do process function. Monotonic watermark estimation, so it takes the timestamp of the of the output element, okay, and then the the one time watermark that takes the the processing time, okay, and that's it. That's all I wanted to cover. Great, Miren. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. So, um, questions for Miren. Anyone has a question? I mean. I mean, it's not, I mean, uh, even if it is not as hard, maybe coding this as he was doing like things with the source API, it still has a level of complexity, right? You, yes, you, totally. need, to be, you need to be familiar with the with all the classes, all the methods you need to implement, the concepts and stuff. So like everything is going to be much more clear once Israel jumps in now and yes. helps with the yeah so, so, yeah so yeah let, let's actually let's, let's let's do an example so there are way more details here that uh, than the one that we're gonna use let's say 60 percent of, uh, of what's here is what you need to make a splitable function like a like plain easy splitable function and then you need more more stuff so great so let me let me then do some kind like let me try to i'm gonna prepare my laptop just give me one minute so if you want to follow live uh here the the workshop today we have this repository in github okay so when well, you have two branches as always okay so you have the the main branch with um, some code and some places where you have to write your own code and the solution with the full code for everything okay and the slides are also here in the repo so you have them here in, in pdf okay so in in the repo if you want to follow the workshop, um, I recommend you to create um, a virtual emp with the dependencies that are in the requirements.txt file, which are basically two. Okay, which is Apache Bean and Kafka Python. Okay, Kafka Python, if you intend to use the Kafka consumer libraries to create a Kafka connector, which is the goal of the workshop at the end. Okay, but here today we're gonna be only doing the synthetic example. So, so why is that? Because setting up a kafka cluster it's kind of complex okay but still you have here the details okay so you have all the details about the pipelines that we're going to be do doing and how to install kafka if you use minikube so you can do it in your own laptop okay so and then you can have just a kafka to for testing purposes okay and and then there are also script, uh, scripts here to help you with with everything so let's have a look at the at the files that are available in the in the repository okay the first one that I want to mention is this one here, Kafka single client, okay? So you have the instructions on how to use this in the repo. So basically, if you want to test Kafka, so you will have to create the topic in Kafka, populate the topic, etc. This script is for that. It will just push data to your Kafka server, and then you can use that for testing purposes, okay? If you want to do that. What data is going to push? The one that is here, a sample from... Don Quixote, okay? So it's the same data as in the previous workshop. Now, we have three pipeline, pipelines in this repo. And this is, this, are the one, this is the one that we are gonna start with. It's a batch pipeline. So the pipeline itself is here created entirely, okay? But then each one of the two functions that are here like this, and I will show more details later, so are to do. So this is what we have to do this ourselves, okay? So that is this batch pipeline which is the first the first we're gonna do then this one here that is synthetic streaming pipeline random data that is generated in a streaming and then the kafka one so today we're gonna do this the batch pipeline we're gonna do the streaming synthetic pipeline i'm gonna leave this here for you to try after that but it's actually going to be very similar to this one so it's really not it's not shouldn't be really a very complex exercise so having said that, just let me let me show you. I'm using Python 3.9, I think. Okay, so this is what I have in my virtual M. So if you have Python and the dependencies installed, so you have everything that you need, okay, to follow the workshop. So let me start with the batch pipeline. Okay, so 
And let me remove this. And I'm gonna first walk through the code to, to see how this pipeline works. So this is a pipeline that is gonna read files from the file system. And in this file system, we can read the same files in different places, like by chunks, okay? So we can read like a large file by splits in parallel, okay? This is the whole point of a splitable do function. Like in Apache Bean, if you take a one file as input, because the file is the input of your DoFN, you will have to process the full file in that DoFN. And that's normally inefficient. Inefficient or even impossible, depending on the file. If it's very large, so you may overflow the memory. So it, it's gonna bring on all kinds of, of problems. We are gonna do that here by having the file as input, but then each one of the restrictions is gonna give us like a chunk of the file to read in parallel, okay? So, because this is a th synthetic example, so the first thing we are gonna do is generating some files, some actually objects in memory, which are not actually file, but they're gonna have the same interface as a file. And then we are gonna process the file in a splitable form. And then we're gonna just print this in the output. When we run the pipeline, we will see something in the output, okay? That we are reading the file. Clear? Questions? So where is the code for these two fns? So here there is this directory, this Python module, my do fns, and there are three files, okay? The synthetic batch, the synthetic streaming, and the Kafka streaming. So I'm gonna use this file first, okay? And here is where these two do fns are defined, okay? Let me just remove that. So what is a file here? Well, a file is only this class, and a file has these properties, an ID, it could be a file name, whatever, but here it's gonna be just a name, um, a number, sorry and a start and an end, okay? And the start is gonna be zero, okay? So like the initial offset of the file and the final offset of the file, well, whatever size it has in bytes, okay? And we're gonna be here generating some files, okay? So, and here I have put some constants for like, for the sake of uh, testing, like testing performance and so on. So here, well, we're gonna generate 20 files of uh, size between two and 30, okay? So let, let's do that. So. We have to create create, uh, create a 20 files here. So how do I how I'm gonna get 20 files? Well, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a for a for loop, okay? And I'm gonna range uh, do, do it like a range, sorry. Yes, okay. And then each one of these case it will be a file ID, okay? How do I create a file? Like this, okay? ID, okay. A start is gonna be always like, and I, I can put it like this, okay? ID, it's key, okay. A start is gonna be zero, and n is gonna be, well, let me, the maximum file size is, um, it's 30, the minimum file size is two, so let's, let's generate some size randomly, okay? Let me put it like this, okay? And size, I'm gonna use rand to generate a random integer between the minimum. And the maximum plus one because uh, the interval is closed. Okay, it, it's open, sorry, not closed. And then so I yield this file. Why I do generate files of different sizes randomly and so on? Because well, so I'm being I'm gonna be running this locally here in my laptop. But for instance, you could perfectly take this pipeline to Dataflow and to test different scenarios in terms of. Uh, performance or Flink or Spark or whatever, and then you could generate like two million files and and see how this scales up with different how many workers is gonna use these kind of things, okay? And you do that just by changing this number here, okay? Okay, so changing these numbers, so is is how you do that. Great. So so we have uh, this this first DoFN is not splitable, it's not anything. It's it's very simple. It's just a DoFN. We have our files up to 20 files that are gonna um, be the input for this one here, okay? And we have two uh, processing chunks. Our chunk is gonna be one, okay? So we're gonna be, so so the, the, the start is gonna be zero, the end is gonna be some number, so we're gonna go number by number, okay? So we could have like, a, we could go in like 10 by 10, okay? But for simplicity, we're gonna go just number by number, but the principles are exactly the same. So we're gonna be processing each, a byte uh, independently, okay? 
So this is going to be a splitable loop function. So how do I know that this is going to be a splitable loop function? Because as uh, Miren explained, so there are two things. So they, well, for sure, the DoFN here. So this is a, a DoFN and the restriction provider. So I'm going to be using the version where the restriction provider is inside the same class as DoFN. So remember that there were two options, stand alone restriction provider or integrated into the same DoFN. So why I'm, in, I'm using restriction provider inside the same, same DoFN? It is a matter of taste in most of the occasions, but sometimes you may have information inside the DoFN that you may want to use for the restriction provider. Okay, like for instance, when we're going to be writing the Kafka connector, we will have a Kafka consumer object somewhere in the DoFN. We can reuse that for the restriction provider too. The restriction provider needs to know, for instance, was the progress of uh, in the restriction. So you use the Kafka consumer, go to the Kafka partition. Tell me what's the latest committed uh, offset. Tell me what's the maximum offset that you have right now. And you can make that kind of estimations by using the same object. No big deal. You could do the same in a restriction provider in a different class with the same consume well, with another object. So, but if you want to reuse stuff, it's better to put things in the same DoFN. So here I have to get this DoFN. And then because this is a DoFN, I need to I need to override this method, the method process. And because this is a restriction provider, I need to override three other methods, the ones that are mandatory. The create restriction, and I don't remember right now about that, but now create tracker, sorry, yes. Uh, the um, restriction size, and the initial restriction, yes. It is mandatory to uh, override these three uh, three methods. Okay. Now, which restriction provider, which restriction track, which or which restriction I'm gonna use, which restriction tracker, and so on. Uh, as Miran said, so there are here a couple of uh, help helper classes. Okay, here now it's recognized by by the by the um, ID. Okay, offset range is one of those, and we are gonna be returning here an offset restriction tracker. Okay, the element here is gonna be a file. Okay, the input to my my file, the input um, to my DoFN is file. Okay. This is my file class, and the restriction that I'm going to be returning is an offset range, okay? And here I will be returning an integer, which is the size of the file, or the size of the chunk of the file that I need to process, to process okay? And the element is going to be a file, and the restriction uh, is going to be... Um, it's going to be uh, the offset range, okay? Okay. So let's let's start creating the methods. The, the first one is the easiest to the easiest to to create because here I just have to create like this uh, the input parameter for the constructor of offset restriction tracker where it is an offset range and this is exactly my restriction that I have here. Okay, so this is easy. All right. Now I need to provide the initial restriction. Okay, and then here I could do two things. I could go to the restriction tracker and overwrite the splits method to provide initial splits. Okay. Why would I want to do that? Because if I do that, I'm kind of like hinting the runner or what is like the initial parallelization that I want to use. Okay. Instead of just letting the runner figure out the parallelization by checking how much time it's taking to process each one of the chunks. And how big are the chunks? So the, the runner is going to be evaluating this, and every once in a while we'll call try split. It will split stuff to parallelize. Okay. Uh, but if we want to help the runner at the beginning, so we may implement that. I'm lazy and I don't want to help the runner. It's the jobs runner, it's not mine. So I'm going to do a initial restriction between zero and the final of the file. The runner will figure out later. Okay. So here I have to return a offset range. Okay, an offset range has two parameters, a start and a stop. Okay, 
Start is going to be the start of the file. And a stop is going to be the end of the file. OK? So here, what is going to happen if I have a very large file, OK, uh, that in the first um, steps processing this file, the runner will realize it's taking a lot of time to process this restriction. If this keeps going as it is, it's going to take hours. So I'm going to split it, OK? And then this will be split it. And the restriction at that point will be, well, some, some, something in the middle, OK? And how this is decided? The offset restriction tracker implements, let's say, sensible defaults for the try split method for the case of files, OK? So or file-like data sources. So we don't have to worry about this. We will have to worry about this in the streaming case because the sensible defaults that are provided are not sensible enough for the Kafka. And what's the size of this restriction? OK, this is easy peasy. OK, so because this restriction, because this is an offset range, it provides this method here. OK, and then I don't have to do anything. In the case of other types of restrictions, I may need to combine the element and the restriction to try to estimate how large is this restriction. For instance, where? In Kafka. OK, because the restriction is going to be some information about the offsets, metadata, Okay, and the element is going to be a partition, and I go with the partition information. I can I can use the consumer, go to the partition and check a partition. How big you are right now? Okay, because the partition is going to be changing in size over time. Because it, every time re it receives new data, it will increase in size. Okay, so we cannot know statically what's the size. Okay, like here. Okay, so in that case, we will have to combine the element and the restriction. But this is easy, so we don't have to do anything else. Great. With this, we have written our first restriction provider. Any questions so far? No? Let's let's do let's do the process method for the DoFN. Okay. So in the process method for the DoFN, for this to be a splittable DoFN, the process method has to provide here an additional argument, which is the tracker. Okay. And this tracker, let me put here the comma, this tracker that is a bin then restriction param like this it is this is it okay so this is what it says that this is a splitable loop function the fact that this has a tracker okay and and this tracker this will be um, an offset restriction tracker okay so because this is the type that we're returning here okay and because the restriction provider is here in this dofn class here i don't have to put any parameter otherwise i would have to call the constructor of the restriction provider here okay great so i have my tracker and i have my file okay so the tracker when i'm processing uh, my file okay and this this will be my file when i'm processing my file okay and i want to start processing my file but i want only a single worker to be processing a single chunk of the file how do I know that the chunk that I, well, how do I know which chunk first? There is no chunk here, there is file only. How do I know the chunk? The tracker. Tracker, I don't, let me, let me put here the type, okay. The tracker. It's gonna give me the current restriction, okay? And this is gonna be the restriction. And this is the information of the chunk that I have to read now, okay? So, um, um, uh, the, the tracker has this try claim position, okay? So basically, I need to take the beginning the beginning of my processing is going to be the start of this restriction okay or or let me see let me put it like this my current position it will be initially the start of the restriction okay and then i try to claim this position okay if everything goes well and i'm the owner of this position process this chunk and if there is something wrong here, well, let me put here a pass. And if there is something wrong, 
I should return, okay? <clears throat> what could be wrong here? No, well, wrong between quotes, many things. The user may have decided to drain the pipeline in data flow, and you then you don't have, you cannot continue processing, okay? If that happens, the track claim will fail, okay? Because the restriction, this restriction, when I process the next element, this restriction will have been split it, okay? And then maybe here I will be already outside the, rest the, the restriction. It will fail and then I will return, okay? I will not return immediately. I will I will keep processing my chunk that was assigned to me, but when I finish that chunk, I will finish and the runner can stop, okay? That's draining, finishing gracefully, okay? There might be, I don't know, may maybe another worker was in charge of this restriction, the worker stopped responding to the service and then came back to life okay and then claim that chunk before me if my worker goes now and try to claim this chunk it will fail so see splittable to functions are not only useful for splitting they are also useful to when you have a scenarios when you need to perform any kind of side effect and you need to know uh, you need to have the guarantee that the piece of data that you are using at that point is not being processed by a parallel worker okay which is this is a typical problem that i see with customers uh, trying to write input output uh, connectors uh, in a naive way sometimes okay so because the, when you are especially in data flow when you're out scaling the same chunk of data may be processed in parallel workers this is a way to have some kind of communication between workers okay so I always tell customers like you cannot have communication or coordination between uh, coordination between workers in a, in, a, in a distributed pipeline. Okay, well, except in this case. So this is a in a way they are coordinating. Okay, because one work, some piece of work that is assigned to one, another one will not be able to to do it. Okay, if it's well behaved. Okay, let's say if it respects the output of this because nothing is preventing you from using this and trying to do the side effect. So th this is really important that any side effect only happens there okay because then it's when you have the guarantee that you have let's say the right to do that okay so here i'm gonna just write something like this i don't know like a file file id position um current position no okay and then i will yield m okay now, uh, this current position here is actually is not only one value. So I need a uh, restriction will be several values. Okay, it will be a beginning and an end. So I need to process more. So this should be actually something like this for current position. In the range of the restriction. Start. Restriction stop plus one because the range doesn't go until stop and then I do this, okay? So, so this is basically the pattern for a splitable loop function. And then I can remove now this because I don't know why it doesn't like the syntax, okay. okay let me try, okay, now. So this is the pattern for a splitable loop function. Let, let's run it in a bit. So we, we, we get the restriction. This is telling us which part of the file belongs to us, okay? We start traversing that. We double check that this is actually belonging to us, okay? If it does, we process, okay? And here I'm going one by one, but I don't know, but it could be, I don't know, it could be here like, a, I think I, like a step, well, this is step parameter, no, well, that was some state parameters here in range. I could go, I don't know, like 100 bytes per 100 bytes or whatever, like and the chunks could be anything, okay? And here I'm going one by one for simplicity, okay? So, so, I traverse the full restriction, I claim each one of the positions. If everything goes fine, I process this. If for one reason, for whatever reason, the position has been claimed somewhere else, this means that the runner has done something that requires me to stop processing, okay? And then it will be the, the, like the other worker that is assigned. If there is another worker, the one that will finish, and if there are no more workers, well, so uh, there will be no more processing. Question. It's 
There are no stupid questions, maybe only stupid answers. I don't know. So, okay, so let's see if that my answer is stupid or not. So here, they are coming from here. These are helper classes that are provided by Bing for, let's say, this typical use case of using a splitable loop functions for reading files in parallel. Okay. Another question. Why do we claim a system and not a plane? Because I'm lazy. Okay, so so um, um, we should claim a range, okay, like a chunk of a file like in, in a real file, no? Because that's how you are gonna have performance reading chunks, not byte per byte. Okay, but that introduces a little bit of complexity in the code, and I want to keep things simple. But yes, in a real case, I would go by chunks. Now, in the case of Kafka, I'm gonna go offset by offset, one by one. Let's say message per message. Okay, so then. And I'm trying to introduce that like little by little with the batch case. So and it will go by one by one in that case. But again, let me let me insist. Yes, you are totally right. In a real batch reading uh, of files, you should read by chunks because that's where the performance gains are. Yes. And you could claim instead of a position, you could claim a, a, a range. So so for claiming here. Uh, well, because we are using an offset, uh, so you, you have to claim a position, but a position could be anything, okay? It, it depends on your tracker, it depends. So so this is a, a method of your tracker, so it depends on what your tracker understands, okay? But you could perfectly claim a range, yes. More questions? So, so the, the claiming itself tells other runners that they don't yeah it's 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 kind of like a semaphore okay so it, it it tells other workers it's like don't even touch this okay so yeah yes i guess then if you were to claim a range then that range would be non-splitable right? that range would be non-splitable yes yes it but but then so how things are splitted you can also define that and, and we are gonna do that in the streaming case because this part is special. So here right now, the, the, the offset could be, range could be split anywhere, okay? But if you are reading by ranges, well, you, you should try to also over, override the try split method to make sure that the, the splits happens at the points that you want. More questions? Okay, so bear with me. So I think you have lots of advanced questions. Some of these are gonna be answered probably in the in next examples. Let's run this. Let's see how this works. Okay. So let me open the terminal. And here I have this my batch pipeline that doesn't ac accept any argument. So I can just run this my batch pipeline. Let me put it maybe here a little bit more of haze. And if everything went well, this should not fail. Hey, so here it is. Okay. So here you see. It. So we are reading each one of the files. And it's one of the positions, okay, for files of different size, okay. Like this was a, a file of the size twelve, okay, and this this was a, a file of size of size six, okay. Here we are running only with one worker, okay. That's why everything is processed in in, in sequentially. So um, we could um, this parameter here. It's a parameter for uh, for, for the direct runner of Apache Bean. I think maybe now we will see some lack of order in the processing, hopefully, let me see. Okay, see, like for instance, like here, like file 18 has been read before file 17, okay? But this is how it works, okay? So so this is what we have been doing, okay? We have been re reading each one of these chunks in the splits in parallel, and for instance, if these chunks was assigned to any other worker, so that worker would have failed and returned, okay? so. Very easy. So this 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 is a splitable loop function. This is like the basics of a splitable loop function. This is it. Okay. This may look a little bit complex, and I find it very complex. It took me a lot of time to study to actually prepare for this workshop, and and me then also had to study a lot. So we were discussing between the two like f for months. Okay, to to figure everything out. But but this is it. Okay. So you create the restriction provider with the tracker, the initial restriction, and the restriction size, and then make sure that you only process data here. Good. Any question? So let's move on then now. Let me see if the video is still running here. Yes. So let's move on now to uh, to the case of um, streaming. Okay. Let me review the 
the streaming pipeline. So we have here this batch pipeline. So we're going to be seeing now this one here. Okay. So the batch case is done. Look, see how is it was this? You may think that this is a silly example, but the next time that you need to read from from a location a list of files and process the files in chunks okay so this is the pattern that you have to apply by doing this you will be able to process the file in chunks like a parquet or an abro or whatever okay like deciding where to split is not gonna be so straightforward but in a parquet you can grab metadata from the parquet okay and then and you can see where are the chunks okay and it will tell you exactly the by offsets for, for those chunks so so like Implementing like a parquet reader in parallel to, to read in parallel will be really straightforward with this. Okay. So, so you can apply this pattern to any to any to in your pipelines. Anytime that you need to read big things in parallel later on. Okay. Like for instance, getting, I don't know, like getting uh, uh, files dynamically from another input, or getting tables from BigQuery from an input, or topics, or any kind of input dynamically that is not known at the moment that you are launching the job. This is a one of the patterns that you can apply to read those in parallel with high performance. Question, yes. Uh, you need to apply more tricks okay so for instance you can reuse this as as it is okay but here when you are reading one thing that you could do is that if you are in the middle of a line you you have to implement some kind of criteria i go back to the previous jump of line or i go forward to the next jump of line okay and if all the workers are doing the same like the the chance will be will be um, there will be no gaps uh, okay and no overlaps either okay so then even though you are assigned a restriction, you are going a little bit farther be, uh, beyond from your restriction until the next uh, jump, on, jump uh, of line, okay? You may still, well, you may still have problems with coordination, so you may need to overwatch some of this. Uh, may, maybe, sorry, because I'm thinking a lot. Maybe it's better to implement this logic in the try splits, okay? When you're doing the splits, so like move a little bit until you find a jump of line and then you, you split at that point. Well, yeah, that, that would be probably better because then the restrictions will be always like full lines. Okay, it, it should, you need to implement this logic in the try split, in the try split method, okay. but it's not complex. Maybe, maybe that could be a good example to to implement, maybe. Okay, M more questions. So let's move on to the streaming pipeline. So I have opened this file, and then I'm gonna be opening this file here. Okay. Let me first have a look at the pipeline itself. The pipeline itself is already written for us, okay? And we don't have to do anything. So basically, we're going to be generating partitions synthetically, okay? In a real example, here we would have a Kafka consumer going to the topic and retrieving the number of partitions, okay? No, and that, well, that, that could be a splitable loop function or a normal loop function, it really doesn't matter, okay? Because it's very simple. It's metadata, okay? Go to the topic, how many partitions do you have? And then emit each one of the partitions as one element. Okay. And then here it's the splitable loop functions, okay, which is within the partition. So what's a partition? It's just like a file, but it's a little bit more tricky because it will grow in size until uh, like a during the life of the of the pipeline. And it may grow in size unbounded indefinitely okay so it's potentially infinite okay and when you we have already processed one element the, the only option is to keep processing the element right after that okay so we have to go one by one and we cannot reprocess all the older elements okay so we can only process new elements okay so that's a partition in kafka so that's how kafka works so let me go here to this, to the my do fns and to the synthetic uh, streaming, and let's have a look here. You will see here that there are a lot of more classes already created for us, okay? Uh, to try to simplify a little bit this workshop. The first class is this my partition. What is this? So this is a class that behaves like a partition object in a Kafka consumer in the Kafka library, okay? It has an ID which is an in in integer, right, exactly like in Kafka. This is the last offset of the partition. So for instance, the partition may have a thousand messages. So last offset will be a thousand. 
and the last committed offset. Maybe we have already processed 113 elements of this 1,000, okay? And then the next element we will have to process is the 114, okay? And, but typically, if the partition is fresh and recently created, last and committed will be zero both in both cases. We can poll for new messages, and this will return some, some new messages sometimes, and sometimes it will not, okay, if there are no more messages available. So this is an optional of int, okay, and the int will be a message, okay? So this topic only knows numbers, okay, so that's it. Commit, we will tell, look, the last messages that you send me, don't send me again those messages, thank you. I have already processed them, okay? Commit. Size, how big you are, like the last plus one, okay? Because we are starting at zero and size has to be positive, it cannot be zero, okay? What's the latest committed po uh, position, okay? So I know the size of the topic, but uh, do I have anything, any message uh, to, be, to be processed, like remaining to be processed? And then this is just a convenience because this pipeline, we want to run it for a long time. And then every once in a while, we will add new messages to the topic. Okay, so this is just a method for that, like for the simulation. So this is like in the Kafka client libraries. Okay. Now the restriction tracker. I I I I, I didn't want to write this in this uh, in this workshop because I hate it. Okay. So two, two things that we have to do. Well. First, I'm, I'm reading from the offset restriction tracker, okay, because it has some parts that are useful for our purpose, okay, like the try claim method is already created in a way that works for us. So I just, instead of creating a restriction tracker from scratch, I, I'm inheriting from the offset restriction tracker and changing the parts that don't work well with Kafka, which are two, the try split method, and the is bounded method. So this is easier. Okay. The offset restriction tracker is for batch, and we are in a streaming. Uh, when we are processing a partition, we will never finish processing the partition. So we have to say that to, to Dataflow, to Flink, whoever, in, in the tracker. So it's bounded. No, it is not bounded. It's unbounded. So we are overwriting that method. Okay. And then the try split is actually different. I'm going to try to explain the try split. Okay. So basically, This will be our restriction, okay? This will be infinite, okay? This will be uh, some offset. And at some point, we will be processing data, 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 data. And at some point, the runner will say, look, I'm going to split you, even if you don't want to, okay? You have to split. So do something. So. When I have already processed these messages, I don't want to process them again, okay? And then I have a lot of things to be processed here too. And the way Kafka works is one consumer per partition, okay? Not more. Like that's like the natural order of Kafka. One consumer, one partition. One partition, one consumer. Two consumers in the same partition. No, one of the consumers will not work. So we want to avoid the situation where we will put two consumers in the same partition. So how do we do that? With the split. So we split like this. So we take this, and this will be one partition, uh, one restriction, sorry, with the split. And from here until infinity, this will be the new split. Okay, so so what will the worker see after the split? It will see this, okay? It will be missing this, but this is fully processed. So nothing, this is all right, okay? And the, it will see this, but it will see this until infinity, but I cannot then process the partition in a split. You can't. This is how Kafka works, okay? It expects one consumer per partition. The amount of parallelization that you can do is the number of partitions. That's it. You cannot go farther than that. Okay. So by doing this, we ensure, let's say, that we don't mess with Kafka. So the partitions are created in this way. Everything that is processed, I prune it, go away. Thank you. And then the new partition is this one. Okay. So this is also important because when we create the initial partition, so we have to get it like this, like the first message we need to process, 
until infinity. Let's see. We will see how we are gonna we are, how how we are gonna uh, process this infinity. So let me let me like a spoiler. There's no infinity. Okay. Like see my laptop. My laptop is finite. Okay. So there's no infinity. So you, how can you represent infinity in, in in a machine that has boundaries? You can't. Okay. Kafka doesn't have infinity either. It has a very large number that uh, ensure that for the next maybe 50 years, this will not be a problem. And in 50 years, lots of consultants will get a lot of money by uh, migrating, migrating Kafka to the new thing because they will be approaching, I don't know, like the Kafka uh, effect year 2250 or whatever, okay? But for a while, this is not gonna be a problem, but there is no infinity. And, which, and we're gonna apply the same concept in our connector. Okay. Questions? So the tri split, how does it work? Okay. So well, let's see how this works. So if there was some clay at, uh, claim before, okay, we start from there. Okay. And if there is no claim, so sorry, if there was no claim before, if this is the first time we're splitting and there was no claim, and this may happen. So we start from the start minus one. I, I, I'm gonna add one later on, so I, that's why I do minus one here. And if we have already claimed something, we assume that the class claim was fully processed and we continue from there. You will see that, like, wh where is this variable coming from? The observation tracker. And this is supposedly a private variable in Python that we shouldn't really be using by inheritance. But since Python doesn't have private methods, so we are doing this like dirty thing, okay? Don't judge me. This was like, this is a way I found, okay? Now you wonder why I like Scala more than Python, okay? But anyways, so the split point is gonna be this point plus one, okay? It's either the last thing that we claim, so we need to process the next one, or we are starting in the zero, okay? Which is the start minus one and plus one will be right at the start, okay? And then if we are before infinity, because the stop is gonna be infinity in this case, but uh, I added this just for clarity. So basically this is how we split. We split at this split point. This left one is the red one, and it will be forgotten, okay? And this one will be, this one will be assigned, okay? So how will the runner know what to forget, what to assign? It will not know. It will assign both to one worker, but here the try claims will fail, all of them, because this is fully processed already. And then it will be discarded when it's fully processed, okay? Try claim, no, return. Goodbye. Okay. This one, the try claims will not return false because it's not full process yet. So the processing will continue from here. Okay. So in a way, we are twisting the arm of the splitable to functions to process Kafka, but well, you look at the source API. So this is much better. Okay. So I promise. Okay. So but this is the restriction tracker that we don't want to write. Okay. So that's why I just copy paste it here. So let's actually start writing code. Let's start with this 2 fn <clears throat> this, this is the, the easy one. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna get some water. <clears throat> this is the easy one. So we have to generate partitions. We are gonna generate four partitions. The maximum size of the partition is gonna be 120. And initially, the partitions will have between zero and 20 committed messages randomly, okay? So <clears throat> let me, so, um, and the input element, we are, we are just going to ignore it, okay? So let's, let's do the same as before. For, for this, we are gonna be generating partitions, okay? Let's first try to get the, the, the committed messages of the, so, We are gonna make something like this, okay? So this this partition will have some committed messages, okay, that randomly, <clears throat> and it will have some size that it will go from this plus one until this, okay? The size it's only for like the estimation of the progression at the beginning because this is going to be running. 100 uh, like um, 24 7 all the time without stopping so the size will keep growing because we will be adding messages every once in a while okay but this is the initial size okay 
So let me see my partition. What do I have to process? Like the ID will be K. What else do I have to do? Let, let me check there. I don't even remember my code. Uh, partition, last offset and committed offset, okay. So the last offset is the size, okay? And the last committed offset is the committed one, okay? And then I yield this partition, okay? Here, this is a normal UFN, okay? Nothing new here. And now the complex one, the splittable loop function. We see here that is in inheriting from restriction provider. So this looks like a splittable loop function. It's a do function for sure. Some constants that I will explain later. And now the process method that I have already created for you. Two important things here in this is a process method. We want to process the partition uh, an unbounded amount of time. So we have to tell the runner, look, you are going to give me an element at the input of this UFN, but I will never finish fully processing that element. Okay. The amount of time that I'm going to require is going to be unbounded. I'm going to keep emitting output every once in a while corresponding to this input, to this input, but the input will never finish. It may finish if the track claim fails and so on, but it, it, there's a scenario where this will not finish. So I tell this to, I tell this to, to the runner. For instance, in data flow, what's the effect of this? If you don't put this, your code is going to work. But every five minutes, you will get a warning, an error actually in the logs, but it's a warning, it doesn't stop the pipeline data flow telling you, look, I gave an input element to your UFN, and it has been five minutes processing that element. Something is fishy, okay? This is what that data flow is gonna tell you, okay? But nothing is fishy, because it's just it is what it is, okay? So with this, the effect that you have in data flow is that you stop that message from appearing in your pipeline. In other runners, this might be even more important. Other runners may kill your pipeline if they think that it is a stack, okay? So this is what it's telling the runner, please don't kill me, okay? And just a slow, okay? So that's it, okay? So, but I, I, I'm still doing the, my work, okay? So this is so this is important. Then the tracker is the same as before. And if we are working or writing a split value function for doing input output in a streaming, we will want to estimate the watermark, okay? So how, what, do, what do we have to, to do with the watermark? Ideally, something in the data should have a time stamp that you we should use for the watermark estimation. Here we only have numbers, so I'm gonna be using the wall time for, for estimating the, word, the watermark, the running time. This is gonna be processing time, okay? Uh, but if uh, I wanted to provide a, a, a watermark, I, I would have, I would need to have some definition of time, like a time stamp inside the data or in, as metadata of the data, and then use a different kind of estimator like a mid and explain, and then just set the watermark to with that, with that uh, time stamp, okay? I don't have that, so I'm just going to use processing time. So this is the loop where I have to, pro, uh, to uh, pr pr produce uh, things, okay? And let me just cover this here, okay? This is code that I would then normally write in, uh, in my input output, out of output connector. This is only for simulation purposes, okay? Every time we don't have data to process, I keep a counter, okay? And if this counter gets very high, I add new messages, okay? So why? Because the show must go on, okay? So we need to keep running to do like to test our, our pipeline. This is a streaming, we don't want it to stop. Okay, it's not gonna stop. Basically, if we don't do this, it will say empty, 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 and it will keep like that forever. Okay, we don't want to do that. We add new messages if we haven't had a lot of messages, like a, like a, during a lot of time. Okay, but but this is a very de deterministic scenario. A scenario. Okay, so we want to have a little bit more of fun. So every once in a while, new messages will show up in some partitions. Okay, just like in real life. Okay, with a certain probability. Okay. And then with this, so we will have our pipeline running all the time. Like here, for instance, I've been running this pipeline since this morning, okay? Like, I'm not sure if you can see it. I've been writing like, this is actually writing to pops up like 200 elements uh, per second, okay? But I have here my, my metrics, okay? Let me see, like the data freshness. It's only using one worker, it's really not great, okay? But 
but it's doing stuff, okay? So this is the same pipeline that we're gonna be writing, okay? And then if I go here to the logs, to the worker logs, hopefully this will not, see? For instance, some partitions here, every once in a while with a certain probability are adding more messages, okay? And some others, no. So that's what, this, so this is what we're gonna be doing. It's like every once in a while, randomly, we are gonna be we're gonna be adding new messages. In this case, this is running with four thousand partitions. Okay, not not with four. Okay, because I was I wanted to run this in in, in data flow. See, the number of parallel keys that are being processed is four thousand per second. Okay. Remember the the one of the talks. I don't remember who who did the, this talk. So, but basically, ah, Pablo, Pablo, the other day, Pablo Estrada. So the in streaming. The amount of parallelization is proportional to the amount of keys that you have, and in the runner, in the connector that we're writing, the parallelization, the number of keys is the partitions, okay? Because well, and again, that's how Kafka works. Okay? Well, anyways, so you want to do that to keep the the pipeline running, okay? So to keep producing new messages. So that's why I added all this code here, okay? But ignore it for the moment, okay? And then I added here a while true. But we're gonna change also this, okay? But let's start with um, with this, okay? With the restriction providers, okay? Here. So here for the tracker, instead of an offset restriction tracker, so we have to provide this here. Let let me see. It's actually also easy, okay? My partition restriction tracker admits as input an offset range, okay? And this is the restriction that I have here. Initial rest restriction. Okay, so let's think here. So we have to put a restriction that it goes <clears throat> from the first message to be processed until infinity. Okay, so I want here uh, an offset range that goes from the uh, from the get from the latest commit po position plus one. Okay, until infinity. How do I put infinity in Python? Any idea? Max? Max what? Max in, very good. It's actually, oh, oh. it was here. Oh. Hmm. Max size, okay, let me see. Okay, max size. It looks like a big enough number. Okay, it's gonna keep the consultants away for at least ten years. Okay, so so we are gonna use this number as the infinity. Okay, so so we need to do that. Um, I think this actually has probably changed in Python three point nine because it was called max int before. Okay, so depending on the version of Python that you're using, you have to put max size or max int. Okay. And basically, well, I'm gonna return this, and that's it. Okay, so return this. So this is how I represent infinity. Okay, this is actually not infinity, but basically, if I recall well, um, Kafka uses 64 bits for the partition for the offset ID, and so so the, the, the and integers here are probably 64 bits too. So this number it's probably the same or very close. To the actual maximum offset value that you have in in a, in a partition in Kafka, okay. <clears throat> and then for the size, so here, if this were Kafka, I would I would like to go to the partition and to check the size at the moment that this is running to make sure that that doesn't that doesn't have changed, okay. Here I'm lucky because I have that a value like like here, like the size that I don't have to go to Kafka. I can just ask it here, okay. So um, the new restriction size then will be, uh, well, actually, you know, here, like the restriction size, mm, there's something I'm forgetting here. Something I'm forgetting something here and I don't know what it is. Let, I, I'll have a look at the solution later because I was doing something else here and I don't remember right now. Well, for the moment, this is gonna be good enough. I just returned rest the restriction size, okay. But I'm forgetting something. I don't know what it is. Let's let, let's actually let's let's write the connector code here. Okay. So let me remove this. Well, let's let's do this first while true. 
So I need to keep pulling the, the partition for new messages, okay? So the typical pattern that you would do, like if you check the Kafka client that I have programmed in the other uh, script to populate Kafka, it has also an utility to, to pull messages from Kafka to make sure that everything is working. So how do you do this normally? You do a while through, you time like wait for a while before the next poll, not to overwhelm the Kafka cl client, and then you keep going. Okay, so this would be the typical pattern. So how do you do that inside a, a process method in a splitable UFN? You you could do a while through, okay, but we are not gonna do it. I'm gonna remove this, okay, and what we are gonna be doing is that here, uh, there's any question here. Ah, no, I nada más. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. So I didn't do anything else in the in the in the in the solution. So the solution is probably wrong. No, I'm kidding. Well, so the, the, you could do more stuff there. Okay, so to have like a more sensible estimation of the size, but that this is fine. Fair, fair enough. Um, um, so, so here, instead of doing this while loop, we are gonna just tell the tracker here when we if we if we reach this point. It means that we have already fully processed the messages that we pull and that we want to keep polling the next time. Okay. So we're gonna just tell look, tracker, I'm not done. Okay. Please come back in poll time out seconds. Okay. And and this actually I have to put this duration. Let me let me so let me let me duration. Let me here import Apache bin duration of this okay so this is what i have to do this okay okay now let's let's start grabbing some data from the partition okay so i'm getting a partition here in the in the i'm getting a partition in in the input so i can pull this partition okay this will give me some uh, let, let's have a look at this. So this will give me actually, it will give me a single message, okay, like a number or nothing, okay. Um, ah, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I just now here I, I close the file that I should. This will give me so this will give me an optional of an in, okay, optional. So if I have something, okay. Um, if I have something, I process. Well, well, I have, and if I have something, I will try to claim it. Okay, this offset to process. Okay, and here, if I have something, I try to claim it, and I fail. This partition is not mine anymore. Okay. This could be sad, but the partition has gone elsewhere, okay, with another worker, not you anymore. So we have to move on, okay? We lost the restriction. We should have looked after the restriction better or something, but it went elsewhere elsewhere. Okay, so so we cannot we cannot keep going, okay? So we need to return here. Um and here, well, let, let's let I don't know, let's 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 Create a message, okay? Partition, partition ID, uh, offset, partition, offset, uh, offset to process, and we can I don't know, like we can put here maybe. An idea of what's the last one that we have to process okay so let's say to, to see how we are going why we're doing we yield this message okay and let me actually change this here because i was i put here like a tuple but i'm gonna put here on the screen okay uh and now now that we have emitted the output we tell the the partition i mean look the message you just gave me I fully process it. Okay, so don't send it again. So why is this important? Because if, uh, for instance, if this restriction goes elsewhere, 
and there's a new, a new consumer for the same partition, et cetera, et cetera, we don't want that consumer to see this message again, okay? So we need to commit. And, and this is what ensures that the Kafka server is not gonna send this again. It's gonna consider it processed, okay? So you better process it correctly because it's not gonna return anymore, okay? And I think this is it. So this is more or less the pattern. So here we poll, if we get something, we try to process it. And if the claim fails, we need to stop, okay? And if the claim doesn't fail, then we continue, okay? We continue processing. And here this will run again in some seconds, okay? If the runner in the middle of this, it tells the pipeline to drain, to stop, whatever, to move to another worker, this will be fine because when it reaches this line, it will do that cleanly. And if we are in the middle of this, like here, it is not until we finish the full process method that this will happen, okay? So here we are processing a single message, but in a drain, we could be processing more like we were doing in the previous example. Here, just we are going just message my message. And we ensure that we have continued in the processing because of the way we did the splits, okay? So this is not shown here, but this is important. This algorithm works because the splits are like that, okay? So we have the guaranteed, <clears throat> we have guaranteed that that will be no overlap and that will be always one single consumer per partition. Okay, okay let me, okay, I screw up here when I reformatted the code because this has to go here. Yes, okay. Okay, now. Okay, so let me, let me let's, let's run this example, okay? So let me, let me, so here, let's run this pipeline here, this pipeline here, okay, this one. This one, uh, with no more arguments, okay? Uh, we, we don't need to input arguments for this example. So here it is, so it's super fast, but this is how, what it's doing. So let's, let's examine what it's doing, so, okay? So for instance, in the partition, oh, so, oh. Let me Let me run it in a different window here. Okay, here. So this is like, for instance, in the partition one. So we are reading the offset 150, the size is 157. Ah, ah, I've lost it. Well, lost it. So here we are reading this, and then see, we are reading here the next one, and then the next one, then nine, 10, like that until we reach 1,660. Okay. Sometimes some partitions are empty, okay, like here, see? And when it's empty, well, we just wait, okay? And and, and how does uh, uh, the uh, Apache mean that it needs to return? Because of the deferred reminder. Every once in a while, more messages are added to partition one, okay? So partition one had like uh, 5,700 uh, messages, and then it had 800, okay? And then every once in a while too, when the a partition is empty for a while, like partition two here, it will get messages at some point, okay? And then, so here, if we want, so this is gonna keep running forever, okay? And we are ensuring that only one instance of our DFN is processing one partition, and because of the splits, we are always uh, ensuring that the processing goes increasing one by one in the number of messages, okay? The fact that only one DFN instance is processing one partition, again, let me insist in this, is crucial for a message queue like Kafka, okay? Because it assumes that there will be only one worker per partition, okay? And the amount of parallelization you can do is the number of partitions, okay? 
So this is why people need to repartition Kafka every once in a while. The performance that you are gonna get is proportional to the number of partitions that you have. But you cannot have like infinite partitions either, okay? So, so well, let me recap what we have done. Let me, let me just stop this. Um, so here, so how does this work, okay? Assuming that we get a partition and that we can poll and commit, so every time we get a new message, we try to claim it, we process it, okay? And if we cannot claim it, we finish, okay? And if we process it and we want to keep going, we keep going, okay? How do we with this, okay? It is this, the one that makes the runner to keep polling things, okay? It's the, the way to implement a loop inside the process method, okay? It's, it's not a loop, but it's gonna be called with the same input, uh maybe the same restriction maybe the different restriction but always with a, a gapless processing okay because we are gonna always be uh, increasing the, the the messages by one and if we are split so we are split in a way that ensure us that we are moving in the right direction okay so well so this is this is the workshop so we have still 30 minutes uh, to go so uh, now I think now it's time for questions. Questions? Yes. So then the split something. Uh, yes. So remember you return two things, uh, the messages that were already processed and then a remainder. Yes. So I'm wondering how this is used by I mean who uses this to so the, the runner when with the try split method has to always return let me let me see if I can go uh, let me go here the try split method let's see if the there's a signature no there's no signature here let me go here the try split method has to return this here this okay so this is what it has to return you have to return the primary and the residual restriction, okay? Or, or none, if you cannot split, okay? So we, we could say we cannot split and just keep going with the partition. Actually, that would probably work with Kafka, okay? <clears throat> the split is just a way of pruning away the, the elements that we have already processed. So this is why we return two, because it's this is what we, it expects, okay? And what's the primary restriction? So the primary restriction is, well, so you are starting here, it's totally arbitrary, okay? So the primary restriction could be anything, but here in the definition that we have applied, so we we, we, we have this partition at the beginning, on our this restriction, sorry. So we have said that this is the primary and this is the secondary. But if we change the order, it will work in the same way because basically what the runner will make is it will assign this, it will assign this. This will be forgotten because the first time it tried to make the try claim, it will fail because it was already claimed. Okay, and then it, and that would be returned, and that restriction is finished, and this one the claims will not fail, and then it will keep going until the next split. Okay, so the order really doesn't matter. Let me try that. Okay, so let me let me let me walk the top. You don't only need to return them; you also have to assign the current restriction to be the primary one. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Maybe then I screw up. Let, let's let's have a look at this. Okay, so I, I I changed the order here. Okay. Yeah, maybe the offset restriction tracker is actually doing that. It's assuming that the left one is the primary. Let, let me let me do that here. Let's see. Let's see. Crossing my fingers. Oh, you are totally right, Miren. You are totally right. Yes, you are totally right. Look what happened. It stopped. Why? Why it stop? Because it assumes that the current restriction is this one. Okay, or like the restriction that it has to keep going is this one. But this one cannot keep going and it stop. It didn't fail because the direct claim is just true or false. It doesn't fail, but, but it stopped. Okay, so the order in this case matters. But this is because I'm lazy. Okay. Uh, yes, 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 it is like that. It's because I'm lazy and instead of writing my own restriction tracker, I reuse this one here, okay? And I just over, uh, uh, have overridden the parts that are that um, that I needed, okay? Yeah, thanks, Miriam. So you're right, exactly. So this the, the offset restriction tracker makes that assumption, okay? 
Now, see, now it works. Okay, yes. So, it's going for a moment that you pass the lines that it needs to go away. This is the one that needs to go away. Yeah. Okay. But this is because I'm overriding this one. Okay. If you create your own restriction tracker from scratch, you have to create more methods. You will have to override those, like try claim and a couple of other methods. Okay. I didn't want to do that because, well, the try claim here, like you will have to do these things that are done here. The try claim, this one, well, it works. Okay. Because basically it's a range that goes one by one. And then if there's a previous one, it, it will the claim will return false. If there's any one, it will return true. Okay. So and so well, so so I was lazy and I was reusing that. Okay, but yes, so here the order matters. But normally, basically, it, it's it's a criteria that is totally arbitrary that you have to decide. But in the offset restriction tracker, someone made already that decision. Question. Yes. So the question is, what happens when we? I'm repeating for the recording. So the question is, what happens when I have a skewness in the size of my partitions, and one partition takes a lot of time? When that happens, what data flow will make is split the partitions, or that the runner. I'm speaking of data flow because it's the one that I know more. But all the runner will work probably in a similar way. It will call the try split. Like, look, you are taking too much time with this restriction. I'm gonna split it to try to help you. Okay, and then some, some maybe some restrictions will be bigger than others uh, when you are in that scenario. In this scenario here, because of the way the try split method it, it 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 works, it will really not do much. The only thing that it will do is it will prune away the things that have been already processed. Okay, but it's gonna take a lot. Okay, it's gonna take a lot of time because well, so we have to process until infinity. So the try split method is gonna be called sometimes. Okay, several times. Okay, so like it was called like right at the beginning, as we have seen in the error that I made before. Okay, so when I changed it, like it stops right away because the, this method is being called at that moment. Okay, so if you are in a scenario where the restrictions are truly splittable, like in a file, basically the restriction will be split until it reaches some kind of balance in the workload across the workers. Okay, uh, so the, it, it will it, it will eventually catch up. Let's say. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. The runner will call the split in order to make the, 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 the distribution of work more balanced. Okay. But if you are in a situation like this where the restriction is not truly splittable, then well, so it will take what it takes. More questions here and there. This might be a bit tangential, but how does this work with PubSub? Because you have partitions and it's dynamically determined uh, parallelism by the key. One question here. So, how does this work with PubSub? Okay, it determines, it determines the parallelism with the key space. Well, the PubSub connector uh, is not a splittable do function in Apache Bean. Okay, um, one way that you could try to apply this concept to PubSub is with the keys, like being a key, like each one of the keys being a restriction. Okay, so, but, um, well, you may want to do that. To avoid reading the same key from PubSub at the same time, but that's actually not a problem with PubSub. So, so I don't, I don't think it really applies to the case of PubSub. PubSub and Dataflow, in particular, and Apache Bean were designed, let's say, very closely, and they work well together in a way. Okay, so splittable do functions don't really solve a lot of issues there. I think. What kind of issues are solved with splittable do functions and PubSub? Say that you want to read dy from dynamic topics at the input. Topics that are part of the data, topic names. Okay, you cannot do that right now because the topic or the subscription that you are reading from has to be known before the pipeline is launched. Okay, so with a splitable function, you could try to implement some kind of dynamic reading of subscriptions or topics. But the reading itself, like the performance reading itself, so no, I don't think that there's any advantage for that. Question, yes. Can you show us how to uh, claim a range instead of a simple position? Well, now you are making difficult questions. So how do we claim a range instead of a position? Okay, for for that, so we will not we would need to 
to create our own restriction tracker okay let me let me show you how that will be done i'm not gonna do it because it's gonna be a little bit tricky okay so let me go here to this class and to this class okay the restriction a restriction there is no class for restrictions in apache beam okay a restriction could be literally any object okay so there is no one it doesn't have to implement anything okay so the restriction tracker has to implement something okay like some method like this is the restriction this is the progress this is the check done <coughs> so here when you do the track lane you accept a position a position is something that makes sense in the context of your restriction okay so what what would you have to do to claim a range so would you have to create your own um a restriction tracker with your own restriction and maybe you could even reuse offset range okay and basically this position here this object this range once you claim in you claim this any other worker claiming that exact object will not be able to claim it okay now if you're working with ranges you will have things like overlaps and so on okay so so you 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 have to design the restriction tracker and the splits in a way that will make sure that the ranges don't overlap okay otherwise you will not be able to claim them because the claim is just let's say equality okay did someone claim this object before yes then you cannot claim it again no you cannot then you can go you can proceed okay but then the range it doesn't work like that so the range if it overlaps so it should it um it should uh, it shouldn't claim that so maybe i don't know um, I'm thinking that you could create your own class with an internal range and, and override the equality operator. Uh, when you're given another object of the same type, you check if there's overlap. If there's overlap, you return uh, true. These are the same object or you return false, okay? But, but for that to work, I think you would have also to make sure that the splits are correct, okay? Because then it would be a total mess because you don't want only like to avoid overlapping. You want also to ensure gapless con continuous processing. And for that, you need to control the splits. So it looks like a mess. Eh? So maybe you want to just claim a position. So you, you receive a range, but then you claim position by position. Okay, so that's it. So the, the, this is, let, let me let me show you the, the example in Kafka. Let me, let me, let me show you the solution in Kafka. Let me, because this is what I do in Kafka, because Kafka doesn't give you a single message. It gives you a bunch of messages, okay, like a range. And then you keep, so what we do here is we keep processing one by one. We commit by one by one, and, and, and that's it, okay? So let me see, like the here, this offset to, oh, sorry, this, it will return actually dictionary because it's a um, topic partition and then the list of messages okay so we get the, the we get the list of messages like here sorry all records okay for the current topic partition it's called topic partition in kafka so we get a list of consumer records messages that we need to process okay and then for this record this is a range okay it's more than one okay but basically we go one by one okay and then we commit also one by one okay you could actually try to improve this a little bit because the frequency of commits it, it also impacts performance okay uh, so you may want like to to make sure that for instance um um you commit this only at the end okay or or you commit at the end or and if the track claim fails then you commit here whatever you have processed so far okay that would be actually a better solution so here you keep track of what you are claiming okay if the claim fails before returning you commit what you have processed and the rest do you don't commit them and then if uh, you didn't call you commit here like you just call commit and all the messages will be committed at once yeah maybe that will be a better implementation so that's how you deal with ranges in a way okay so yeah but the track line it's here like this that's a number only one number this, this record offset that's an integer More questions. 
Well, if there are no more questions, so let's finish in five minutes. Just let me show you very quickly. So how this works in the case of Kafka. In Kafka, we are getting a partition, but the partition is only an ID, okay? And then we need to transform this in, into an object partition, which is this one, same as we had before, okay? Except that we also have a Kafka client here, okay? This create and get consumer, basically it creates the first time it is seen and then it reuses the same object, okay? And then we get data with the, with the poll, okay? And then here, well, this is only for informative purposes because we put a message of how many messages are left and so on, okay? And then if there is something, we traverse, we yield, and we commit, okay? And if we fail the try claim, we return, okay? And then when once we have processed all these records, we defer reminder. We don't have all this simulation because, uh, well, so we don't need it. That's, this is another script that is in the the repository that allows you to, to push messages to Kafka every once in a while. So the way I run this, is like I put this running, and then when I see that there are no more messages, I, I run the other script again, and I pull more messages, and I see how it works. And sometimes I pull like 10,000 messages at once to see how it scales. Sometimes uh, just uh, one message to like to debug the uh, how it's behaving, and but it's very similar. The pattern is really similar, okay? And this is what I told you, like for instance, in the initial restriction, well, so we use the Kafka client to get some information about what's the committed offset to start the range there, not in zero. But we could have started in zero too, no? Doesn't matter. Well, no, we couldn't have started in zero. No, we could have started in zero, yes. Because when we do this, if it's committed, it's not gonna be returned. It will return the next one, okay? So it really, yeah, so. So this is how it works in the case of Kafka. Very, very similar, okay? <laughs> it has the details of creating the Kafka consumer that I wanted to avoid and, well, setting up the Kafka server and all that, but it's very similar. Question. <laughs> Sun, Sun are translating, yes. I was wondering if it only makes sense for reading or it also makes sense for writing. I think it, I think it makes more sense for reading. There are situations like the parquet I/O that they did, could not read parquets by chunks, and now it, 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 it's, it's now it can because of a splitable function. So it makes more sense in in, in let's say in connectors that were not well enough in the bin before. In writing, I don't know. I don't know. So if you can think of a situation where two writers shouldn't be writing the same record at once with the same key or something like that, so you can have a case where, where you can do that. Normally, in the kind of databases where, where you, can, you, you can write a record with a key, if you have two concurrent writers at the same time, so the database will be smart, smart enough, let's say, to... to, to to, to be acid, no? So to make sure that two concurrent writes happen actually in a sequence, okay? Um, uh, and if it's the same element, so it will be an item potential. I'm thinking of a, like a key value store, something like that. Two workers going to write the same key, okay? If the key value store is acid in the sense that two parallel writings will be actually sequential, that is no big deal. Maybe you will you would gain performance with an splitable loop function because you would avoid that situation happening. Two workers with the same key trying to go to the same element, to, to, to like trying to write the same element at, at, at once. Okay, with the splitable loop function, only one of the two would have the claim, and that has let's say the right to write, and the other one would forget. Okay, so maybe, yeah, maybe it makes sense in situations like those. But it is not a big problem to solve. I think the input part was more problematic or the dynamic part. Like I have this list of topics, subscription, this list of tables, this list of files that are coming in the data and I want to read them. Those were the situations that were normally difficult with Apache Bin. Okay, and these are the situations that are solved with a splitable loop functions or not difficult that were like lacking performance in, in Apache Bin. Now you can parallelize on those two. Okay, so I think that's probably the main use case more than in input than in output. Yes. Is there an implication on uh, how the drummer needs to be designed? Totally. Yes. Yes. Is there an implication in the runner, uh, in how the runner works for a splitable function? So that was the question. And yes, totally. Data flow has two different runners. 
uh, there are more changes, not only this, but the runner V1 doesn't support the splitable do functions. The runner V2 supports the splitable do functions because the runner is totally, well, not totally different, but it's different, okay? Um, and this happens in the case of a, of a data flow, it happens both in the Java and, and Python runners. Um, in the splitable do functions, there is coordination between the workers, okay? And, and before that, the Apache Beam model always assumed that there was like zero coordination between workers. And here now we have some level of coordination, the, the uh, mechanism, okay? So, so I would say no. Yeah, I would say yes. Like the, the runners are totally, and, and not all the runners support support splitable functions right now. I think Spark, Flink, and Dataflow, and not many more. Let me let me double check here. Uh, like, look, this it is like bounded splitable do function. Dataflow, Flink, and that's it. Ah, and the direct runner and go. Data flow, the direct runner, and so, but not and, and unbounded. Let's see, like data flow, flink, the direct runner, and and some things are not actually not supported, not even by the go runner yet. Okay, or maybe this might be outdated. I'm not sure, but yes, but the um, the go. Ah, uh, this is the go direct runner. Yes, so it's actually supported all in some of the on, on the run. So see. So not not no like I would say it's data flow and flink are probably the ones that have support for 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 this and see like the, the uh, uh, sorry the, the, the it's not complete like dynamic splitting is not supported for unbounded splitable functions yet and it's not supported in flink for bounded splitable functions yet bundle finalization so it's not supported in the case of flink yet so yesterday there was a talk about uh, writing a streaming pipelines in Go using splitable do functions, where they talk about the, the interplay between the trying track line and bundle finalization. So yeah, like no, this is ongoing work, and I would say no, no, it probably uh, Flink and Dataflow are the most advanced runners with uh, Bean, in my opinion. So and it looks like that like, these are the only two that support splitable do functions at the moment. Yes, question. Yeah, this this is a good question. So, could be there a, a, any risk condition between two do, two workers doing try claims before the work is committed to like to Kafka in this case? No, that could not be rest conditions because that's the commit is not with the runner. The commit is with the the message queue in this case. Okay. Once you get a true in the track lane, that chunk is yours. And it's it's like a child a child. Okay. It's your responsibility to make sure that you fully process that and that the that the let's say any side effect is fully performed. Okay. Because no other worker will uh, process that chunk anymore okay so and if you don't process it then that will be like loss of data in the processing so so there's there's no interplay between track lane and commit because track lane is with the runner commit is with the message queue okay and the track lane once you have, have the track lane the element is yours and no one else will be processing because any other track lane will will return false and you have the responsibility to ensure that because you have been given the claim that you are honoring the claim okay so so if something fails there so you have to do like error handling and everything to make sure that you fully process that element and that you commit that element in the message queue so what it will happen probably, and again, here I'm talking about data flow behavior, what it will happen if it fails and it keeps failing, the same element and the same restriction, uh, yeah, same, not sure exactly what it will happen, the same element and the same restriction will be eventually be processed in another worker. And if the try claim don't fail, and, but, but, but yeah, but, but, but I mean, if you have already done, done a try claim, no, so I think that, so you need to do it, so. Uh, yeah, and if that fails, so that will be data loss. Even if it's a process, if because it's if processing another worker, so the track claim will not will not return true. Okay, so 
if, if, if your tech claim succeeds, so you need to succeed as well. So that's it. So, or that will be data loss. And, but this is a, a runner dependent behavior. It depends on how this is implemented in, in the run. But the try, there is no two phases claim. It's only one claim. Okay. So when you are given a claim, you assume that you have ownership of that element. More questions? Yes. So it's for the only when they idle connectors. Not only, not only. So the question is, splittable defense are useful only for IO connectors? Not only, they are very useful for, for that, but there are other examples. There are blog posts, for, um, like, um, for instance, for Monte, Monte Carlo simulations. And so, yep, so um, not only. So I, I would say other examples are probably like more force. Uh, it's, it, it, this, is a, this was created mainly for IO. But it's, that is not, it's not the only situation. Anytime that you need to coordinate the workers somehow to make sure that the only one element is processing one single worker, a splittable function, it's a, or that you need to rebalance the work, or you need to dynamically react to input that you need to like to uh, um, to read. A splittable functions are, are, are useful. But I cannot really think of many examples of that. So probably, let's say, most of the cases, the big majority of the cases are going to be input output okay so well so thanks everyone